For the best audio experience, we strongly suggest you use headphones whilst listening to Bubble and Squeak. Hi, I'm Peter Santoscano, and this is Bubble and Squeak, a podcast with uncanny sounds, funny interludes, and stories, most weird, many true. Our show today comes in two parts. Part two, a sound slice with the story about caring for somebody's body. Part one, writer Wendy Sanford shares the origins and the evolution of the groundbreaking women's health book, Our Bodies, Ourselves. Um, Yeah, I'm a writer. You know, if it's pertinent, I'll say that I was involved in writing for the book, Our Bodies, Ourselves. I'm a Quaker. I'm cisgendered, white. I am a lesbian. I'm married to Polly Atwood. I'm a Democrat, which was new in my family. An editor. I edit things even when people don't ask me to. A dog lover. A cook. And also a mother in a relationship that's been somewhat difficult over the years and a grandmother of three young women whom I don't see much. Well, back in the 1960s and early 70s, there was no information that was trustworthy for women about our bodies and in particular our sexual health, our reproductive health. A group of us got together and started researching that and taught a course called Women in Their Bodies. People were so interested in it. And then people contacted us. They heard about it and they contacted us from New York City and other places where there were starting to be groups of feminist women wanting to take charge of our health care and make some changes. So we printed up our monographs on various topics and that eventually became our bodies ourselves today there's so much information out there and yet the the question still is is it trustworthy information is it from a woman's point of view is it put out by the drug companies what are the politics of access to health care for women at all levels of economics and social class and race and So the questions are still there. The the work is needed as much as ever. I wasn't openly lesbian at first. We were all heterosexual women, which was so funny because the press thought we were, you know, feminists were bra burners and lesbians and all of that. And we were just, we were just this group of, of women who happened to all be heterosexual at the time or thought we were. So I, it was wonderful when I finally came out Well, it was wonderful for me that I came out because I ended up with Polly for 42 years. But it was also wonderful for the group because finally we had a lesbian in the group. We uh, had this chapter called Our Changing Sense of Self, and even the title would be a warning today. Who's this we who's saying our changing sense of self? Who can proclaim what our changing sense of self is? Right away, we got feedback from African-American women's health activists and Native American women's health activists and Latina women's health activists that we couldn't say we. We were a group of white middle-class women. Our book focused a lot on our issues and said it was for all women. Some of the critiques were, Why don't you talk about sterilization abuse? Why do you focus on abortion totally to the exclusion of sterilization abuse when sterilization abuse is something that is really, really affecting Latina women, for instance, in Puerto Rico, particularly at the time? Uh, What about the right to decent prenatal care? We just kind of assume it, but in fact, for women living in poverty, that's a right that's never recognized. And back then, As sadly, well, criminally today, the rate of mortality for African-American expectant mothers is much higher than for white women. That was true at the time. And as I say, criminally, it's true today. So people were saying, you say we, you say you're speaking for all women, but you're not. And that was a real wake up call for me. I had some struggles in the group over the years because there were some people who were really attached to that moment of excitement that we could say we and mean all women that we were what we were learning in our lives and our consciousness raising groups was relevant to other to 
to women all over. And that was very heady and very exciting. It just was only partially true. Well, we redid it, I think, 10 or 11 times over 40, 50 years. And each time we widened the understanding of we, of the we. We added a chapter that was written by women with disabilities, by lesbians. The lesbian chapter was was a great enterprise. The first lesbian chapter that we added actually was by a collective of lesbians in the Boston area. They wouldn't let us touch their chapter. They had to just put it in the way they thought it should be. And so we agreed to do that. It was all very exciting. And in our meetings, I was always very shy and nervous because I felt like they'd look at me and see something, which a few years later, I saw it in myself. I realized I was lesbian too, and I actually worked on the first redo of that lesbian chapter. Each time we included more experiences from a wider range of women and more concerns from a wider range of women. All over the country, women's groups were tackling different issues becoming active and organizing around creating women's clinics, researching DES, which is a drug that women took mid-century that had led to birth defects in the children, particularly the female children, vaginal issues. There was so much activism going on and we wanted to reflect it. So the book got bigger and bigger. And then in later times, uh, like the most recent one I worked on in 2011, oh, one of the big changes in the book at that point was that we had always had a lesbian chapter and a heterosexual relationships chapter. And we looked at each other, those of us who were working on it, and said, this is ridiculous. The issues in relationships, there may be one or two things that are different if you're a heterosexual or a lesbian couple, but not many. So now there's a relationships chapter. There was no one in our group that identified as trans at the time, but I had done some reading and realized that trans women, particularly trans women, but also gender fluid people, that they also had really significant issues that needed to be present in a book about women and their bodies. I had been putting more and more about trans issues in for the past decade or so. But in 2011, we actually had several trans and gender fluid people who helped write the sections that were pertinent to them. I'm always surprised when people say to me that I seem so comfortable in my skin. It's so not true. I am often very uncomfortable in my body and with my body and with other bodies. And I'm particularly squeamish about any type of body fluids. I was an EMT for a short period of time, and I was a terrible EMT if there was any blood, saliva, or other body fluids involved. Over Christmas and New Year's this year, this squeamishness got tested, and I was really surprised with how things turned out. My husband and I traveled to the East Bay, California, to visit his sister and her family. His sister Lisa had been struggling a losing battle with cancer for over a year, and she was at the end of the journey, all treatments failed. Up until that point, up until the day we arrived, in fact, she was pretty well able to look after herself. She didn't drive anymore, and she only went for incredibly short walks up the block and back. But she made her bed and washed her clothes and prepared meals for herself and walked up and down the stairs, even though people offered to help. But that was changing quickly. A home health aide came for the first time and turned out to be a really bad fit for Lisa. He had never actually worked with a dying person before, and he had never worked with a female patient. He felt uncomfortable, he told us, about the intimacy 
of caring for a female body. It was the next day I was chatting with Lisa at the end of the day, and she was very tired. She was struggling, she said, to take off her compression socks. They're these incredibly tight, tight socks that help feet and legs from swelling. So I said, I can help you with that. And I did. And the next day, I helped her again. And she said, oh, that I'm supposed to actually be putting some lotion on my feet and legs every day, but I just can't get to that. I can't reach down at the end of the day to do that. And I said, well, I can do that. And within a few days, I was doing more and more for Lisa. Some months before, Lisa had sent me a message and asked how it was when my parents died. They died at home. She wanted to know about the details of what that was like. I was not a primary caregiver to my parents. I couldn't. But my older sister and some cousins and friends did all that work. And at the end, they had to do everything. I mean, my parents lost the ability to leave the bed, to clean themselves. They became like babies. So I shared this with Lisa, and at the time, she said she'd rather have family take care of her than a stranger. And I thought to myself, oh, I would so much rather have a stranger (laughs) wiping my butt. (laughs) I mean, I really don't want a loved one's last memory to be of that. So months later, I'm there with Lisa, and after talking it over with my husband, I made an outrageous offer. I said, Lisa, if you are comfortable, I'd be willing to be your caregiver for the rest of your time here. She thought about it and said yes. Every day, it was amazing to see this woman who had been so successful in her career, like a really high-end software developer, manager, CEO-type person, every day graciously handing over more and more control over her medications, over her schedule, cleaning, everything. And after caring for her for two weeks, she died very peacefully in bed with the family all around her. Let me set the scene for you. I am sitting outside in the afternoon, about an hour after Lisa passed away. Her body is still inside, and I'm waiting for the hospice nurse to arrive, Gladys. Gladys had been there earlier in the day. She checked Lisa's body from head to foot to make sure that there were no sores or any issues that needed to be addressed. She turned to me and she said, wow, she looks great. You've taken very good care of her body. So Gladys is coming back. She should be here any minute. So I'm just going to sit outside here and wait. In this episode, you heard Wendy Sanford. She recently published a memoir of friendship across race and class. It is called These Walls Between Us. In an upcoming episode, Wendy will read for us from the book. Bubble and Squeak is written and produced by me, Peterson Toscano. I mostly make the show for me and for my nephews, Jesse and Lee. You can find me on Twitter or TikTok or just walking around Sunbury, Pennsylvania. Oh, and thanks for listening.